Então, é, em nome do Comitê EOR, eu gostaria de dar as boas-vindas a todos e agradecer a professora Juliana e a professora Farem Alamiger, não sei se eu pronunciei corretamente, uh, por estarem conosco nessa manhã, debatendo um tema tão importante para a nossa academia, que diz respeito aos debates que a professora Juliana já vem desenvolvendo atualmente no tema 2. Uh, eu vou deixar que elas falem mais a respeito, mas antes disso, gostaria de fazer só uma breve apresentação e, e, e abrir a fala para que as professoras possam desenvolver seu trabalho esta manhã. So, uh, Professor Farin, uh, I welcome you and Professor Juliana and all the participants of this meeting today. Uh, now I will read your uh, resume in Portuguese so the audience can understand a little bit better what is your current research. Uh, and then I will uh, open the space of talking for you and Professor Juliana to develop the activities of this morning, okay? Marina, só um instantinho, toma a sua fala. A Farin está dizendo aqui que a câmera, ela não está permitida a abrir a câmera. Ela não está com permissão. Ah, obrigada, Juliana. É... Adriana e a Natália, podem nos ajudar nessa questão, por favor? Obrigada, Adriana. Uh, Professor Farin, can you please test your video? She's trying, but it's not working. Adriana, ainda não conseguimos. <laughs> Uh, she's saying that both the video and the audio is not are not working. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe she's not allowed to be the speaker. Uh, it's not enabled. Desculpe a intromissão, eu, eu não sou palestrante e eu estou autorizada com áudio e vídeo. É, não sei se é uma questão da própria conexão da professora Farrin. É, creio que todos aqui devem estar com essa habilitação. Não sei, uma, uma pergunta para a Natália e para a Adriana. É, obrigada, Fernanda. Pergunta. A Adriana diz que sim, a nossa monitora está habilitada para todos. Uh, so, uh, professor Farrin, uh, other participants can enable sound and video devices. So uh, people are suggesting you to go out and uh, log in the platform and get in the room again. Can you please try? É, não sei também se pode ser, porque a gente, nós estamos inscritas no evento, né? Não sei se tem alguma coisa a ver com a plataforma, não, né? Nesse caso, ah. quando está liberado é, para todo mundo, o participante que tem que começar é clicar na opção Start Video aqui na, no canto superior esquerdo. Eu acho que agora está conectando o áudio dela. Ela saiu e entrou, está conectando, mas está fechado de novo. 
É, eu acho que o, o vídeo é ela que vai ter que liberar aqui no cantinho okay. inferior. Great. Now uh, we can uh, see uh, you, Professor Farang. Uh, am I pronouncing your, your name correctly? Yes. Oh. Correctly. Thank you. Good. <laughs> so, uh, I will speak in Portuguese for a little while, and then I will um, introduce the audience and give you the, the word, okay? Então, colegas, estamos aqui nesse momento para a palestra internacional da área de EOR, a nossa conferência internacional, eh, que tem como título A Anatomia de um Genocídio Lento, os Apátridas Rohnigian e a Economia Política do Capitalismo Racial. Eh, para falar hoje, eh, temos a, o gentil aceite da professora Farren Almigir, que é professora sênior do Departamento de Administração na Monash Business School de Melbourne, na Austrália, e tem como área de pesquisa abordagens interdisciplinares que se concentram nos temas de pobreza, governança e questões de gênero. Ela examina os desafios e mecanismos organizacionais a partir da perspectiva da justiça social, direitos e capacidade da comunidade envolvida e afetada em resposta à globalização e iniciativas de desenvolvimento sustentável no contexto das realidades organizacionais locais. Sua pesquisa atual se concentra na cadeia de valor global e nas relações de emprego com foco na indústria do vestuário em Bangladesh. Ela recebeu algumas bolsas de pesquisa competitivas para trabalhar as condições de emprego e os desafios enfrentados por mulheres trabalhadoras de fábricas de roupas prontas. É coordenadora do Governance and Regulation Research Network, Garnet, que é uma rede interdisciplinar localizada no Center for Global Business Monash Business School. Para debater, temos a presença da professora Juliana Teixeira, atualmente professora adjunta do Departamento de Administração do Centro de Ciências Jurídicas e Econômicas da Universidade Federal do Espírito Santo, professora permanente do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Administração desta mesma universidade. A professora Juliana é também líder do tema 2, Estudos Organizacionais e Interseccionais, articulando raça, etnia, gênero, sexualidade e classe no mundo do trabalho. Uh, so I welcome you both, Professor uh, Farin and Professor Juliana. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you here this morning, uh, and I'm sure we will have an uh, important and interesting opportunity to reflect upon your researches and uh, be my guest. That's it. That's uh, your turn now. Thank you. Uh, Professor Farin, uh, could you please turn on your uh, microphone? Okay. Yeah, uh, do I need to uh, talk okay. about myself? Um, as I understood that you already uh, gave a few brief. Exactly. Uh, I, I read your translated um, curriculum. So the audience, uh, we, we think that the audience can understand most of the talking in English, but um, it, I, I thought it was interesting to give this brief uh, introduction in Portuguese. So yeah, yeah. we'll make sure everyone can uh, get engaged. Yes. So uh, the audience has uh, listened to my, I hope, has listened to my uh, presentation of your curriculum. And I also introduced uh, Juliana, Professor Juliana. So if you want to uh, highlight something about your uh, career and your current research, we will be pleased to hear you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm Farin, as um, please call me Farin, and my current research is uh, focused more on genocide uh, and uh, slow and ongoing genocide uh, on the Rohingya community, which I'm going to discuss uh, um, now. Um, if you allow me. And hi, Juliana, it's nice to meet you. We exchanged several emails and this, now we meet virtually. Uh, and I also see a few of my friends are here, Fernanda, Denise, and um, Anna, Anna. So hi to all of them. It, it has been years we don't, um, we, since we met. So now if I'm allowed, uh, can I share my uh, slides or do you want me to talk um, 
do you want me to share the slides or you do or i can talk if you the whatever mode you prefer you can do uh, the way yes. you prefer okay 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 mm -hmm. so let me share the screen as since i uh, developed some slides so this paper is about uh, uh, of the anatomy of political economy of slow genocide and organizing of racial capitalism. I have been uh, working uh, on uh, on this, not in this paper. I've been working with the uh, in a, uh, with the Rohingya community since 2017, um, and uh, our the paper I'm uh, going to talk about now. Uh, it has also got uh, best critical ethics paper this year in the Academy of Management uh, uh, of Critical Management Studies Division. This paper, um, uh, the, uh, it, it, I co-authored this paper with Habib. Habib. So as I said at, uh, in the beginning, that it's not about the paper, it's all about the uh, project uh, or the research we have been doing. And that's that is some that is I wanted to highlight I want to highlight uh, this uh, morning uh, in your morning in my evening because it's nine thirty p.m. here uh, here in Melbourne. So we started this paper because we wanted to understand uh, what is slow and ongoing genocide. We took the and we we thought about it when uh, in two thousand seventeen. Uh, one, uh, one million Rohingya. Rohingya community is an ethnic minority community of Myanmar. They are they are basically Muslims by religion, and they are they are acknowledged as a minority Muslim community of the state of Rakhine because they live in the Rakhine state of Myanmar. The state name um, was before is Arakan, and the state has has a border with Bangladesh. So it has been 40 years, uh, there is the, the uh, Rohingya community uh, are um, taking, have been taking shelter in Bangladesh when there is a, when, when there was a kind of violence they faced, um, particular, this particularly state orchestrated violence. But in 2017, when Aung San Suu Kyi came into power back in 2016, in 2017, there was a Clear, there was operation, um, uh, which is which later was regarded by the units here and other human rights commission uh, the uh, that operation as a clear or clearance operation. One million Rohingya fled to Bangladesh, and it 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 um, immediately drew global attention, and then uh, in. In here in Melbourne, me and Habib, Habib is the um, Rohingya activist and the found, and the foundation secretary of Australian Burmese Rohingya organization. We started thinking about to do something uh, to communicate it to the global community. And since I'm an academic, so it came out as a paper. And we thought by that time we come, came across many uh, came across that since Rohingya and their uh, plights and they and as they have been and their um, uh, the violence they faced it, it 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 drew the global attentions it became an issue uh, in the media too and we came across Amartya Sen's this uh, this quotation about the slow and ongoing genocide. He, he suggested that what Rohingya, Rohingya community as a minority ethnic community of Myanmar has been facing last 40 years, it's a slow and ongoing genocide. This is not a genocide the way we theorize genocide or the way genocidal convention has theorized genocide uh, or what happened in uh, Khmer Rouge or Cambodia or what happened in Holocaust. He, he, focused, he tried to keep he asked us to focus on that what sort of things have been going on, that you are not allowed to work, your citizenship entitlement has been um, revoked or annihilated, you are not allowed to work, you have, to, you, uh, you have been made as internally displaced people and you are forced to live in a camps 
and you you are you are all kind of basic pro, basic um, entitlements or basic uh, basic needs are um, are you are you have been disposed of all kind of in, entitlements and basic needs like right to have lively, livelihoods right to have education right to have public health care facilities so indeed it is it it is indeed a capability deprivation of an of a of an individual and of a community and they have been forced to live in a camp for last 40 years as an internally displaced people. So Sen suggests that it is a slow and ongoing genocide because when we talk about genocide, particularly on Holocaust, we talk about the um, 6 million Jew, they were, they were killed. But along with the 6 million Jew, there were three, um, 3 million gypsies who also got vanished from, the, from that specific space but we don't consider it as a genocide because we always think about any any kind of a state orchestrated violence or violence by majority community to the ethnic community as a violence and we try to find out there is a genocidal intent but to become a genocide there is an exact definition by the UN and there are some scientific process and therefore genocides that has been that the minority ethnic community has been uh, they have been facing always remain it could be an indigenous community in canada it could be and in our case it's a rohingya community in myanmar in uh, it, it becomes a genocidal intent but it is a slow and on ongoing genocide and sen asked us to find out that how we can theorize this um, slow genocide. So this paper is about the political economy of slow and ongoing genocide that Rohingya community has, has been faced, uh, they have been facing or experiencing for the last 40 years. It, it is a, it is a co-authored initiative. I mean, it, it is a joint initiative. And, and since we both are um, in, um, a bit, bit, uh, initiative, uh, in a sense, me and Habib, we try to Habib is a uh, Myanmar refugee in Australia. He came to Australia in 2000. He came to Australia in 2009, but um, but uh, he he had been in a, uh, in an island, Christmas Island, for three years. It, it took uh, for three years. It took three years for him to come to the main island of uh, Myan uh, of the of Australia uh, in uh, that is Melbourne. And then he got an identity as a Muslim refugee of Myanmar. This is something they consider is very important. When Myanmar government wanted to take away their any kind, um, wanted to make them uh, internally displaced people and, and wanted to dispose of them any kind of institutional identity, within that kind of understandings, Habib and other Rohingyas, they think, the Rohingyas, they think that there are these identifications. Uh, that they are the refugees of Myanmar is an in his, as an institutional identity. It is important because it relates them from the space where they are from and and where, from where they have been evicted. So, this in this paper or what I'm going to talk. <clears throat> It is all about the identity, identity politics, the politics of displacement, the politics of dispossession, and the politics of evictions, ex, um, um, evictions, expulsion, elimination, and extinction. <coughs> Excuse me. So in 20, uh, 2017, we, uh, over the years, we came across that at, at, along with the um, Amartya Sen, Spivak has also sent out a call that we need to think globally. We need to think globally in a sense that identity work and identity politics is over. It is now something that we have to think about in a global context. And it is our responsibility to present or represent them who cannot represent themselves. So this is something that where I would like to focus that represents them who cannot represent themselves. So it is a call from Gayatri that identity politics is over. We need to think about how we can relate, how we can represent each other. 
And that, that is the way we develop the methodology, the method section or the methodology section of our paper. This is some, uh, and that, that, and therefore, I all, I mean, I feel quite hesitant to say that it is a paper or it is a project because it is something where we both are involved. Being a Bangladeshi, being a Bangali, and I, and basically I'm from Bangladesh. For me, it has been 40 years of experience to see Rohingya's plight because Rohingya's first came to Bangladesh in 1978 when Myanmar government uh, enacted their um, uh, uh, enacted their enacted an act and to, took away Rohingyas for identity as an ethnic minority community of Myanmar. The Rohingya community got this identity as ethnic minority community by the British census in 1948. In nine, um, when Myanmar became independent in 1948, Rohingya community was part of a, they, they, they were the part of the nation as a national community, but, and again, as an ethnic minority community. The first, when the polit then army government, army uh, military regime took into power, they took away first their identity as ethnic minority community in 1974. And that, that was the first time they fled to Bangladesh and took a political shelter. And in 1982, the uh, army, army government again came out with the Citizenship Act and took away their uh, citizenship rights. They, they, uh, they came out with the analysis from based on a history that uh, where they took 1824, the year between the war between British and Burma as a takeoff point and, and draw a conclusion that those who came after the war, they are not the, they are not the indi indigenous people or they are not, they are migrants. So, and thus they made Rohingya community as a, uh, took away their citizenship rights and they, and give, and provided them, uh, an identity of internally displaced people. This is important to understand that here, me as a Bangladesh, as a Bangali, as a majority community of Bangladesh, who, who is a part of the nation and the nation making process now being located in Australia, we started working, me and Habib, Habib who is Rohingya by identity and, uh, and a um, refugee here in Australia, as a, as a Myanmar Muslim refugee, we see that whether, how we relate with each other, it's not, and that is the first time, uh, and it was the first time we understood that it is not our identity, positionality, or reflexivity, the way we usually try to understand politics and the politics in relations to the research method to present ourselves. This is not the, this is not the way we relate with, it, with each other. For it is more our political reflexivity that that has brought us together, our vulnerabilities, our concerns that what has been going on is not, it's not, it's something that we, we felt responsible and, the, and we felt that here lies in our accountability as a researcher, as an activity, as an activist to say something to the global community. It could be a global community of scholars, it could be a global community, but it is, the, it is our vulnerabilities out that, that emanated from the situations we had been through or we have been still through that created some, some uh, uh, that created, that, that has drawn us together. So we see our, uh, we, we, we tried to give our, um, we, we tried here to exchange our accounts in between ourselves. And then we came, we tried to understand what has been going on every day in relations to Myanmar, in relations to Bangladesh, Bangladesh where Rohingya communities are located and what has been going on in, um, what has been going on in uh, Australia? We we found out Australia, uh, Australian government's relationship with the 
of the government relationship with the with the Aung San Suu Kyi's government or the Myanmar democratic government or government uh, in um, or the state in a transitions to the democracy although knowingly that there was a clearance operations behind it and the genocidal in uh, genocidal um, ethnic cleansing they all uh, they have been con uh, organizing against the Rohingya community because an Australian government tried to in um, uh, try to cover uh, cover all these arguments by saying that it is important for a democratic country. It is important to have a tie with the democratic country because and help them in terms of uh, providing them soft military uh, support in terms of uh, training and all because uh, because they're fighting insurgency. But they don't want. And here we see how global community they want. Uh, I mean. Um, here we see that how global community try to uh, homo, uh, tend to level everything when it is democratic, even it is an insurgency oper insurgency operations. They wanted to continue it. We wanted to focus here that our every that every every day or every incidents we tried to con we tried to take. Uh, I mean, we tried we tried to note and uh, take a note and we exchange it to understand that how our political reflexivity worked in terms of understanding our issues related to slow genocide. And thus we situated our solidarity or ground our solidarity in this research. So in this research, it is very important to understand how we become we, because identity, it is not identity positionality as a, a and a, uh, that, 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 that indeed the way we, we have been brought together, it is our political reflexivity and our vulnerab everyday vulnerabilities related to these issues that have brought to it, us together and help us to situate our situated solidarity and to, and to consider, and thus we consider us, we are we. We draw this entire methodology from the transnational feminist scholars like Richa Nagar, Pia Chatterjee, and um, particularly from Nagar and Pia Chatterjee. Nagar's, uh, Nagar's uh, work in, in the context of Sudan, and as well as with the Dalit or scheduled caste women, um, women in India, uh, her collaborative work with them, with the scheduled caste women in India and in Sudan, helped us to understand that, that how our vulnerabilities are, are located across the geography. So space has a, has a different kind of implications, even as an, even as an epistemology, even as a, I don't want to use epistemology because this kind of, this type, when, whenever we use this type of notions, it is quite, it became problematic for us to justify these as an epistemology or something particularly by the, uh, the, by the dominance of methodology of, labor, uh, of liberal uh, regime or, or by the uh, white scholars. And as a result of that, uh, we usually, we use it as a space has a different connotations that connects us because Habib is in Myanmar. I was born in Myanmar, raised in Myanmar, me in Bangladesh, we are located in Australia. And, and within this process, there, there are many other states that get involved. So, and um, displacement, displacement and the eraser of identity implies a misrecognition for a community. And it, is also, it also implies disconnections from history and the anthropo anthropology and the background of a certain community. So their eraser of, eraser of identities or eviction is not a, it's not some it's not very simple it is something that is that is a disconnection from the history and from the background and that and here the military regime came uh, they produce the knowledge a uh, uh, historical knowledge and and drawing on that they try to um, the, they, they have been trying to provide a racialized ways of seeing so against that racialized ways of seeing and math methods of knowing, we have to con we have to find out a platform that how we how 
an academy of citizen of Australia and basically uh, a citizen of Bangladesh and a refugee and, uh, um, and, a, and a refugee and internally displaced people became we to talk about their, um, uh, their, their uh, about the slow genocide. So it, along with the Amartya Sen and his speedworks, we all and a transnational and transnational feminist uh, scholars we use or you can say that I we to take their help to come out with a, um, uh, to to locate our study in a in a particular context. So we um, aside from this, you know, the way we do usually research, we need to consider particularly this kind of research when our lived, which is located in our lived experience and every day lived experience. So, uh, so um, this is quite difficult to, um, quite challenging um, uh, to come out with some concrete. And we tried, other than the primary resources, we also tried to uh, uh, find out that whatever the quotes are there or key, uh, key issues are, are being discussed in case of Rohingya's um, a slow and ongoing genocide. So we talked, we already, I mentioned about um, Am Amartya Sen's uh, um, statement about the slow and ongoing genocide. Amartya talked about that how, how history can be revoked and can be rewrite. There is a, how there is a process of truth generations by, the, by, the, by those, by them who have got the power and how suspicions is cultivated against a community and another community and how their citizenship got revoked and there is a disposition and disconnection, displacement and disposition can be happened, but the, but the disconnection with, from the history is important for any minor ethnic minority community. And then Spivak asked us to ask us to feel responsible as a global academy, as an academic and as a group, and this is the call she sent out. So there is a felt responsibility. There is an issue of building trust uh, to become a we. And then we tried, we found out that how the refugees in the camps, they talk about their life. They said that a, a refugee life in a camp is like a, it is better, it, it, is, it is like a zindalash, which means that living in between, in between death, I mean, as a dead body, but there is a life in, I mean, my body says I am alive, but it is not at all alive. So living death. And this has been the situations for a community for 40 years. They can't, because they are not allowed to work. They are not allowed to go to school. They are not allowed to have, do, even they have to take a permissions to get married. So displacement, dispossessions, and is their experience. But along with this, when this has been going, why it is a political economy of slow genocide, because along with this, we see that there is a, when there is a displacement, there is a, again a re replacement or resettlement, which is common in everywhere. The ethnic minority community or in, indigenous community, they are replaced and then there is a resettlement process. And he, in, the, in, in, the, in case of their, uh, re, uh, when, they are, when they were displaced, there has been resettlement of Rakhine Buddhist in, in the state of Arakan, and Arakan name got changed and became Rakhin. Everything has got implications here. Even the change of the name means the change of the history. Change of the name of the state also means change of the history of that space and change of the, uh, of the people or the community they, who used to live there. And while till 80s, it, uh, it, it, uh, the army regimes, they con uh, organized the regime of terror, as well as the regi uh, regime of truth as a legislation to constitute Rohingya's dispossession, we see from 90s that there was a sort of, you know, there was a sort of um, economic, uh, economic reorganization. There was a trade liberalizations and as well as 
land acquisitions from the Buddhist from the Buddhist community along with the um, Muslim, Raki Rakins Muslims community who are already displaced. And those land acquisitions were done by the military. And when there were, when there was a sort of deregulation it started from nine from nineties, we uh, and and uh, us, we noted that a mark of uh, capital and investments has been there from the neighboring country like China, India, Vietnam, and Indonesia and Singapore. But it is also important for us to for uh, for for us to think. I mean, to consider that it is not all about the um, capital investment. Neither it is all about the investment of capital, and therefore these people are displaced. The way it is, uh, it is, it has been argued by ben, uh, Bobby Banerjee for almost a decade that uh, accumulations for extractions, accumulations for uh, um, expulsion, uh, extraction, and accumulation, uh, and uh, and the corporate investment and corp and establishment of corporate property rights. This is not actually we can see we can say in this case. Of course, there there uh, there there is investment, and we see the in the uh, liberalization of the economy, deregulations uh, further became. Uh, I mean, further became more relaxed when Aung San Suu Kyi came into power or during the emergency period, during the emerging period as an em emergent economy of the Myanmar. And, there, and that, that has been the period when we also noticed that how capital has been to some extent um, managed by the, uh, by the military regime or by the military officials and the and the faction of the ruling class, and and they have they have got a certain kind of relationship with the, uh, with 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 the clergy community or the or the monk monk who 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 are the who are the head of the uh, Buddhist uh, religion. Here we see the notion of political society, and we we have brought the notion of political society at the up front to see the dynamics between the dominated community and the dominant community. When a dominant community has been replaced, the dominated community are resettled, but the dominated community resettlement did, uh, did, not, I mean, did not have or, uh, organ, I mean, wasn't organized in a way that we can say that their property right ha has been established. They were resettled, but there is there has been a process of poverty uh, management and pauperization. So the community, so the capability of deprivation of ethnic minority community of Rohingyas has been organized against has been organized against the majority community. So poverty manage. So it's not about the corporate investment. It is about the poverty management or management of pauperizations has been organized in a social cost benefit analysis. Till, till 80s and 90s and, there, and within, that, within that process, there is a consolidation of state capitalism that which became later a sort of crony capitalisms and um, shared by the uh, by the clergy community and the and the retired Burmese Bar, uh, Barmar or the um, retired um, army, army officials and 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 the civil and bureau, civil bureaucratic government. Our point is here to look at the militarization process and the extent of militarization process with the government, with the political government with the community, with the civil society organizations. And here community, we mean uh, the majority, majority, majority or the dominated community of the political society, the intensity and extent of militarization. So once Ulf says, Patrick Ulf told us that said in, in case of the internal colonialisms, we see that invasion is a structure, but it needs maintenance. But interestingly, we, we, we 
came with the, we, what we discovered in case of slow and ongoing genocide on when we tried to um, unpack slow, uh, the political economy of slow and ongoing, uh, ongoing genocide, we, we found it's a logic of extinctions that, that works. It's not the logic of eliminations that assimilates, that assimilates the settler as well as the indigenous community and try to establish settlers' property rights. And that is the main base, that is the basic aspects of the um, internal colonialism discussion of settler, in case of the settler colonial states, we found out this, all this independent nation state who became independent in 1947 after the second world, world war, there in 70 years, there has been a constitution of a political, so, uh, the faction of political society dominant and dominated, where there is a majority always is a uh, privilege because they can provide the consent con and, and that consent legitimizes all kind of state orchestrated violence or corporate violence. On the other hand, the dominated community, they remain outside the boundary not even the capital or capitalism outside the boundary of, of the way we think about life world or organizing of life. <clears throat> so, and, and how if the legal regimes can, can make a, a, an identity or citizenship status or whatever the political liberal values we consider that can can homogenize our status like the, uh, the issue of citizenship rights, nation, and all these are not indeed homogenized when, it, when they are translated in the context of the uh, global south, not even a homogenize in the context of the global north or the settler colonial state, but it is, it is, it is it, it, this political liberal values there is some uh, dichotomy is embodied and, there, and political liberal values can successfully generate, actively and successfully generate substitution logic. And we see that substitution mechanisms in, 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 every, in case of everyday mechanisms that one, one ideas get substituted or replaced by the other idea, even the democratic process, even the way it runs, the entire process of the liberal political regimes shows how the substitution process works. And, and here, the, sub, the, the capability deprivation is substituted of one community by the, by the, under the poverty management process of the majority factions of the society, they are Buddhist and they are from, they are Rakhine and they are Buddhist. And on the other hand, within the nation state apparatuses and, and within the nation states, there has been an organization of life and living in camps for a specific community. And so that, that makes us, in, that gives us, that, that is something that we find, in, find that it, we need to think about it, that how, uh, unaccountable space and entity of camps are there and constituted within the nation state apparatuses. And there and people like Rohingya community have been there for, for 40 years there as a non-accountable people or as an internally displaced people. So an unaccountable uh, ident, uh, entity and unaccountable space camps accommodate unaccountable or non-accountable people. Of course, they are, they are counted, but they are not counted as a population of the state. They are not counted as a community belongs to somewhere. They are counted as, as, as the people who live there and they are not accountable, neither, um, I mean, as CAM, in that sense, is not directly accountable to any institutions like the, like the state. So this has been a mechanism of organizing life of certain 1.2 million people over the 40 years. Organ, I mean, within the liberal political re regime and the, and the liberal uh, uh, economy. And, and so, this has been so 
Should I continue or should you do you have a question? You can cont uh, you can go on and after we go to the discussion. Okay. Uh, how many minutes are there? I can't <clears throat> so, um, most in interestingly, what we notice after 2017, when 1 million uh, Rohingyas uh, fled to Bangladesh, uh, and, the, and, and one Cox's Brothers, one part of Bangladesh became one of the largest refugee settlement area of, of the world, so what is the largest, what the number of people, this is not important. The important we find that 134 NGOs are involved, $755 million uh, invested for, for, uh, uh, for, for the supervision of, the, of all those camps and this 1.2 million people who are, who are again identified in Bangladesh as internally displaced people. The politics that is, involved here that they cannot be given with the refugee status because once people or a community uh, uh, have got this status as a refugee, the, the state where they live or where they're located, that state is, support, is obligated in a, by the Refugee Convention Act of the state of the United Nations to provide them all kinds of facilities that is usually are pro, is provided to the, uh, to the people or, the, or its citizens. So the politics is here that they should remain or they should be identified as internally displaced people. So in, now we have moved from the politics of the Myanmar government to the politics of the camp management. There, as, we, as I told you, that there has been involvement of the NGOs and the UNHCR, and Australia is the third largest donor uh, country of UNHCR on Rohingya issues. Other than that, uh, we, uh, the, when army uh, atrocities uh, became, um, became, an, became an issue, Aung San Suu Kyi had, 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 had to face some, some kind of a global, uh, global uh, challenges about the, about the real situations of the state where this Muslim uh, minority community they live. According in their language, Rohingyas are Muslim minority community. And United Nations wanted to send their human rights commissions, but Suu Kyi did not agree with the United Nations and Suu Kyi asked Kofi Annan's uh, uh, commission uh, com, uh, organizations to to do a survey on the state of the uh, minority community. Here, these names are not important, but what I wanted to uh, folk, uh, I wanted to um, highlight that is the repoliticization. So so far we do discuss about militarization, and we discuss that. Uh, there is an ex, uh, extent of militarization of social relations, but here we see how repoliticization re works to support the militarization of the, not only the state mechanisms, militarization of the business, business, militarization of the civil society organization, and the militarization of the politics and repoliticizations by, by involving a private civil society organizations. To, to ensure legitimacy of a transitional democratic government. And on the other hand, there has been another kind of life in a camp where we see that $750 million or economy, which is involved in rehabilitating rehabilitation program or running a rehabilitation economy. Of, certainly this, is a, this economy is a part of a formal economy whether we whether these are counted as an but of course and uh, i mean whether we consider it the way we de define capitalism it is different but but 
here we can see that even, even the life, which doesn't have any value, which is a death living, that life can generate value. And in a sense that because of them, there has been a rehabilitation community. Aside from that, since, this, since they are in a cage in camp and whose mobility is restricted, certainly there, the process suggests of incarcerations and prison. If anything happens, so as a result of that, surveillance is too high in camps and there is a economy has we consider has been running due, due to the surveillance, the purchase, I mean, the procuring of surveillance apparatuses, procuring of manpower in, in a state, uh, in, in case of the police or army or state apparatuses who are involved in, in surveillance. So there, there has been an economy is running for the surveillance. Along with this, there is a human supply chain of trafficked Rohingyas that we often came across uh, in 2015 and 2013, 2015, 2018, by the report, uh, by, by, the, by, the report uh, by the newspaper reports, particularly by Guardian, that how Rohingya community, Rohingyas are employed in a Thai seafood uh, uh, Thai fishing boats and are involved with the, Thai, with the seafood, um, seafood supply chain. Rohingyas are also involved with drug paddling. The question is the people whose legality and whose legal identity has been revoked and who lives in between the legality and illegality, it is, of, it is certainly uh, easier for them, easier for them to be trafficked or to get involved with with this, uh, with with the with with the process or with the mechanisms, which is not illegal, but which is which which helps them to survive. So, but it, which has some criminalized criminalization aspects. So there is another kind of community survival and uh, economy survival and criminal economy. Aside from that, in camps, in setting up camps, in setting in 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 uh, setting up camps in in terms of you know this ma this machineries, uh, materials as well as the internet service are provided in camps. Uh, all this suggests that there is a consumption economy has been running even in camps. So suspended lives, the lives which the uh, internally, I mean the people who's uh, from whom all the mechanisms of living has been snatched. So if we consider and who are who are in a, I mean, sanctions, restrictions, and uh, are, are, are there everyday mechanisms of make, of organizing life that suspended lives, it is interesting so to see that how it contributes in running four kinds of economy, which also gives us an idea first that interventions and here, the interventions is also militarist interventions when interventions and human, uh, human humanitarian uh, uh, interventions for humanitarian care are all, you know, interlinked. So interventions first was, uh, was a military interventions and the interventions in the second phase is, a, is in a humanitarian, uh, it is a, is a form of humanitarian assistance. All interventions are there in order to maintain the structure. The structure is that there is a structural conditions for, for organizing genocide. So these people should be, should be in camps and their living should be organized there. On the other hand, there is a process, a process in a sense, we see that this parallel process of living or organizing life for, for the people who are majority, who are privileged in organizing life for who are minority, this rehabilitation economy, surveillance economy, justify the other functioning of the economy in a broader context and provides legitimacy of capital. Capital that is invested by Chinese investor, by the Vietnam investors, uh, by Indian investors. In the case of uh, not only in the in the state of Rakhine where uh, Rohingyas had been in Myanmar, so there is a uh, in there is a process of justification of cap, uh, of le and legitimizing capital. Uh, other than that, it also uh, the Rohingyas um, 
Rohingya slow and ongoing genocide also gives us an understanding that development interventions, what we came across during in the 70s and 80s through their capability deprivations, and later um, what we came across now, the organizing of living in a camp, whatever it is, the development interventions and uh, emergence, emergence as an emerging economy, economy is first a political project. So there has been a constitution or, 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 or making of some people who could be displaced when the economy is going to be, when, when the market intervention is important. So before the market interventions, it was a capability deprivations, but when the market interventions we came across in case of the uh, Myanmar, these people were, there was a clearance operation. So these are the fundamental issues that I that we see here, that how interventions are there to maintain this structural condition of genocide and, and interventions for development or emerging as an emergency economy is, is a, first is a political project and then is an economic project. And most importantly, it gives us an idea that racism is not racism, uh, it's a communalism. We can see here uh, how capital negotiates a space with the communalism and, the, and, the, and with the military regimes. So there is a certain kind of capitalism has been, uh, has been emerging in the regional context, in the context of South Asia, basically, that, with, with, that is a military corporate capitalism which is overtly violent and communal. Racism is something that is often debatable because, because there is an omission and there is a, I mean, there is an elimination uh, and assimilation process. And through the assimilation and elimination, there is a process of omission. But when the logic is extinctions, what we see in case of this minority community, we, we, we consider that it is basic, it is directly communalism, which is not, which is built into the structure of the economy, which, which is also, um, and, we, and they're not only, uh, which is built into the structure of economy and their representation has been denied in the national narratives as well as in political discourse. And along, and this is, this is certain, Cert, I mean, certainly this is a caution, caution in a sense that along with this Rohingyas, 1.2 million uh, Muslim uh, community in, uh, of Assam, the state of India, and are in limbo because Indian national registration, nation's registration certificate and citizenship amendment bill have, have this both together as um, legislations have, have jeopardized the living or the life world and the status of this 1.9 million uh, Muslim community um, of India. So it's not about India, and because along with India, there are 70,000, no, 700,000 uh, 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 people from Chittagong Hill, uh, Hill Tracks of Bangladesh as an indigenous community, the indigenous community, they have moved to India. So we, cons we, since this is the geography we considered, but we see that this has become a trend and it is important for us to know that citizenship is not a permanent issue for, for the community who, particularly in case of the nation states who became independent in the last 70 years. So we are not talking about here that way, the way Banerjee discusses in his paper, in the voices of the governed to help us to understand how the political economy of, uh, of accumulation has been organized through the process of extractions, because his analysis was basically based on land. And he assumed that citizenship status is something permanent. It is not, it is not, um, it, it, it could never be in flux. So he wanted to theorize expulsion and the agentic representation of the expelled uh, of this uh, expelled community as a translocal resistance 
And he draws on from internal colonialism to understand the internal colonialism in case of the um, in case of those uh, nation states, those who became independent. And he generalized again, not only the political society uh, as a notion of in, in his arguments of voices of the com, uh, voices of the governed by omitting the particularities in between the dominant and dominated faction, because for him it is it became important to theorize the translocal uh, resistance, but that that is not our focus. Our focus is his homogenizing trend and elimination logic of elimination. He also applied by homogenizing all the states as a democratic state and in institutions with the with with what the community interacts as a democratic state apparatuses. This is certainly wrong because Indian democracy and Bangladeshi democracy, Myanmar's democracy. These are not equal, and most importantly, militarizations and then awkward uh, ownership of uh, in terms of governance approach between the civil government and the military regime is evident in case of the developmental states. So we cannot theorize every the state apparatuses or the state as a democratic state. So, but this we do. There is nothing wrong in it because we do this because. Because at the end of the day, accountability matters for the liberal, the way liber, liberal knowledge regime works. So we want to, so he wanted to make the enforceable apparatuses accountable, wanted to create make, wanted to create a questions against them, against the enforceable apparatuses, and wanted to legit uh, wanted to ensure again the legitimacy in other way around. In our uh, in our research. What we uh, see here is political society, by bringing in political society up front, we focus here that there is a dominant and dominated factions. And when, when there is a I mean, certain kind of trend we have noticed in the, in the management of organizational studies, we, to us, everything matters. To us, organization, uh, unit of analysis matters. That with uh, 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 that, what uh, in terms of replace in in terms of placing our research, uh, it it uh, to us theoretical contribution of our the, of our research matters. Empirical contribution of our research matters, and we try to understand drawing on that. And we say he in the within in. Uh, to this, uh, on these issues, our position is that the modalities we used, drawing on transnational feminist um, uh, feminist scholars and our political reflexivity, draw, and based on our lived experience, we see that how how we can, how we are being connected, how we are related, and that that help us to understand and then contextualize our realization as a political part of the political society to understand the slow and political economic genocide. The political, so we bring in political society at our front and its dichotomies and what if, and dominant and dominated factions to show that neither the, uh, neither the homogenizing of political society is going to work or thinking about those people as economic agent is going to be something just I mean, it's not going to do justice to them because they have a right to live as a citizen, as a, as a people, they have right to have freedom. So they don't, it, it, so what uh, other researchers like in our MOS in the management and organizations domain, Chaudhry and others, they ask for that business should come in and in business, inclusive business practice should be there so that these people can work and can be employed. So, um, so we should make this uh, camp as a non-cooperative space. They identify and they want. They ask us. They ask the business to make it inclusive uh, space. But the question is, why as an economic agent? And so, once political society's agentic representations and then political society as a peripheral affected stakeholders in the discussion of corporate citizenship. And then as an economic agent, all are problematic. We, and if we have to consider any kind of uh, 
business studies or MO uh, or research and organization studies where political economy is an, is, is an issue and an accumulation. Because political economy, when we think about there is an accumulation that comes in organically, we have to think about the political society and its dynamics. And uh, because it helps us to see beyond the uh, politics of identity and gives us an understanding and um, gives us an understanding that how we should theorize um, the others who are a part of the social transformation uh, program of the developmental states of the last 70 years. And it should start from demilitarizing the context. Thank you. Thank you, Harim. It's a pleasure to listen to you. Um, good morning. Uh, to do an audio description, I'm a black woman with brown skin and curly hair. Uh, I, I am in my house, so I am in environment with pictures, a plant, a white ball behind me. I'm wearing a black blouse. It's a pleasure to mediate the firing conference and to learn from her. Uh, we have today great learning and reflections, and I also want to thank Marina Dantas, who is here as a member of the scientific committee of the Organization of Studies Division, which made this conference possible. This year's annual meeting theme is facing the great challenges of society, the role of management, managers, and organizations. For the reason we believe it's great for our community to have you as a speaker, Farin. Uh, Farin is talking about the anatomy of a slow genocide, uh, the stateless horinga in the political economy of racial capitalism. Uh, in, uh, in Portuguese, anatomia de um genocídio lento, os apátridas uh, rohingya e a economia política do capitalismo racial. I think it's important to say that Rohingya is a community of Myanmar, that is a country in South Asia, as we know. It's the largest country in mainland South, Southeast Asia. The country is also known as Burma, a name determined by the British colonies after the country's annexation with the Indian colony in 1824. Myanmar gained formal independence only in 1948, the formal independence, né? after more than 100 years of colonization a fact that contributed on large scale to the current military and democratic complex, complex in the country. And Farin discusses the, the organizing of genocide against the world's largest de facto stateless community over the past four years, bringing up a much sense categorization, which says that Haringa's experience of genocide is a slow genocide. And I think that this concept is low genocide can bring to us important reflections about the genocide that happens here in Brazil with black and indige indigenous people. And it's also important to say that her paper with Habibi Wuraman discussing it, received the best critical access paper in CMS of the academy this year, which shows that we are talking about themes that now are being recognized for the academy but that we are talking in organizing resistance for many years. Uh, then uh, we listen to this brilliant researcher who, ha who help us establish relationships between racism and capitalism from a racial capital capitalism perspective. We also want to thank uh, the others here. I want to po point out that we still have some minutes to a discussion. Then you can ask her questions, you can uh, then open the microphone. You can also write those questions here in the chat if you want to open the mic even better. And I'd like to uh, start uh, making a question to you, Farain. Um, again, thank you so much for your lesson. So nice to hear from you. From you. And I want to introduce our discussion uh, with a question for you in dialogue with reflections that we have been doing here in Brazil. Uh, a Brazilian professor and researcher named uh, Ana Paula Procopio da Silva argued that coloni co colonialism, slavery, and abolitionism without rights are structural conditions for the constitution of Latin America uh, proletariats and bourgeoisie, 
as well as the limits of liberal democratic legally legacy independent capitalism. Thus, the relations the relations between the constitution of national states and the class societies include the historic subjects active in the different economic, social, and historic formations. And to make this discussion, Ana Paula establishes a dialogue between the theories of two Brazilian authors. One of them is Clovis Moura, a Brazilian sociologist and writer who, influenced by Marxism, develops what he calls the sociology of Black practice. And on the other hand, we have Lélia Gonzalez, who is a Brazilian anthropologist, philosopher, and writer who was already articulating the discussions of intersections of racism, sexism, and capitalism in 1980, even before authors from the North American global named the word intersectionality. And Lélia Gonzalez develops a category that she calls Amefricanidade, something like Amefricanity, a mixture of Americ Americanity and Africanity. Uh, in a quick reading, it's possible to say that the word is limited to defining the geographic condition of Black people in the Americas. However, the term created by Lara Gonzalez goes further. It indicates the construction of ethnic identity with the incorporation of cultural dynamics, especially those that go against the system of domination called racism. Uh, for her, it's important to go beyond uh, Roman, uh, romant, uh, romanticized view of Africa to turn to the reality of the American continent, recognize it, its influence on the cultural formation and valuing the tactics created here against colonial domination. And Clovis Moura, Clovis Moura uh, when he discusses the Black Praxis, he studies these forms of resistance, this practice of resistance by the Brazilian Black pop population, especially taking the Quilombos, which were communities made up of enslaved Black who fled as resistance organizations. And it brings an important debate to us about this non-homogeneity -homo of the working class uh, right, bringing this experience of Black workers. And then Ana Paula coming back, uh, she, say, she says that Clovis Moura thesis on Black resistance as a structure of, of Latin America dynamics, the dialogue with the Americanity category proposed by Lélia Gonzalez and present themselves as a contribution to anti-racism in the debate of social classes in Latin America. However, they are two authors who, as Black authors, will end up being little used in the debate on social classes in our context. Uh, then uh, I would like to, to know if you perceive in the context in which you study this eraser of theories developed by non-white thinkers in the debate on the formation of social classes and on capitalism. Uh, uh, th that would be my question to, we can dialogue about our perspectives here. Thanks, Juliana. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks, Juliana. Um, the first and foremost, what I, what I find the problem relating to uh, when we talk about racism or um, racial capitalism, the problem starts with this, uh, that it is quite difficult to find, uh, to get a definition of a structural inequality because it is a structural inequality. It is a structured within the society, within, within the political narratives that, is, that you mentioned the, that constitutions, that causes the inequality and that inequality, and out of that inequality, there is, an, there is violence and that violence is often, I mean, basically and most always intuitively evident and that, that creates a commun communalism. People don't like to talk about communalism. People like people talk about racism because it is easier to discuss. It is easy, it is comfortable that we talk about racism because the problem is discussion of racism is always there is a debate. And that because of this debate, there is uh, 
I mean, that, I mean, we can see how, how major issues can remain invisible. I, now I'm located in Australia. I think I, I took more than an hour to discuss the paper, but what I, and I missed that point that Australia is a settler colonial state. So here from Bangladesh, I came to Australia. So from an independent nation state of 70 years back, as a settler colonial state, I try when I when I think about any kind of uh, theories, it's certainly I think about the indigenous communities. What 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 indeed the indigenous theories and the academics they talk about, and it is quite difficult to find out that in the, how how indigenous um, I mean indigenous academics and their work of that is the eraser because you we don't see i mean in my in monash my six years lifetime i i never taught any indigenous student because and that that says the process that says how structural inequality works so currently in australian context if that i mean they are the indig indigenous scholars and they have been they have been trying to theorize um, uh, this uh, epistemic. I mean, I, I think their position, yes, of eraser is there, of certainly, because eraser is, I mean, the knowledge we talk about, we, we, uh, we talk about management and management is strategic, but we hardly talk about the knowledge management is strategic. I, we have been trying in our this paper. I mean, we talk about knowledge regime, liberal knowledge regime. It's conditions of like that. How why we wanted to become we because we need to find we need to have a legitimate legitimate voice and we need to have an authentic voice. So that is the problem with the liberal knowledge regime, and that is the way the liberal knowledge regime constitutes violence because because of these two conditions that. Who, would, who is going to be the legitimate voice? Now, appropriation of, in terms of knowledge is common. And uh, particularly it is common in the settler colonial context. So epistemic eraser uh, is, a, is, I mean, it, it, epistemic, I mean, I can't, I can't give you a specific example that this is the, these are the academics who are talking about epistemic eraser. But there are certain kind of scholars, like I said, if Tuck and others, but I don't, I haven't, I haven't drawn from the from indigenous scholars because I because I it's not I mean how I how should I frame it? Because I'm I am a child, I'm I'm a I am I build I I am an immigrant. So I so transnational feminist methods speak to me because I am I am also I'm mobile, but certainly epistemic eraser is an issue, not only in relations to academics, epistemic eraser means the representations of the uh, or um, presentation of the voices of the others who are already historically disadvantaged and not being there. And I, I work from that perspectives, but, uh, and this tendency, I mean, I mean you know, particularly in our uh, scholarly domain, this is a dominant tendency. So epistemic, I mean, even this decolonization, which we, at the end, we tried to cover in our paper that decolonization of management studies or the knowledge regime with, wouldn't be, wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't mean, wouldn't be meaningful if we don't understand the political economy of knowledge management, because eraser comes in from there, that who need to talk and who should be, who should talk, who decides that. 
Okay, thank you. We have here some comments about your presentation. Denise Barros says, uh, what a wonderful presentation. Ana Silva, great presentation for Rain. And Fernanda Sauerbrunn says, an impactful and much needed presentation to uncover power structures that rely on the complicit of business school in hiding from us in other contexts, genocides under the cloak of their universalizing and universalizing knowledge about organizing. You brilliantly challenged this process. Thank you very much, Farine. And uh, we have a question here uh, from uh, Juliana Schneider, Ms. Kita. Uh, she's asking, I'm partially shocked to think how this, new, this news doesn't reach us here in Brazil. And I imagine the opposite doesn't happen either news from Brazil, uh, reality and geno genocide of indigenous, indigenous and, black, and black populations, while the war in Ukraine is a constant part of our news and mobilize a huge commotion, a commotion and solidarity situated in Europe and by white people. I think of this as one more strategy of racial capitalism so that countries in global south that are affected by coloniality cannot create bonds of solidarity and alliances to overcome this international organization of racial gen genocide. I would like to hear the teacher, Ryan, talk about it. Sorry, about, about what? Uh, okay. Any specific? Uh, it's the question of uh, Juliana Schneider. The of the colony cannot create bonds of solidarity and alliances. Yes. So. Okay. okay. Uh, she's I saying that uh, here we don't. Uh, this news about what is happening uh, with the, the hmm. community in Asia, we, we don't listen to the news here news in Brazil. And that she and that she's imagined that the opposite doesn't doesn't happen either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah because, because there is a uh, there is a process of insinuation in between this global South people and therefore, um, and the media, I mean, I mean who holds the, those who are the own, I mean, owner of media, it, it is their choice. So what should be known as, um, uh, because the way this is, this is the politics of, the, this is the knowledge politics and the man, managing of the knowledge politics that what should be known and what should be, uh, how the uh, consent should be manufactured. And, um, and we, and it is also interesting to see that how there is a co-optation. So in Black Lives Matters movement uh, took place in 2020, we, we assume that there is some hope over there in terms of the solidarity against the racial capitalisms uh, and, and the voices and um, more, more politically reflex research, research should be, uh, we, I mean, we thought we and that we expect, but, um, and we see some changes too in time, uh, like there is an special issue from organization on decolonizing management studies in our, in our scholarly domain. And there is an special issue again by organization on Black Lives Matter. So uh, we need to think about that it is, uh, it's, uh, uh, we, we need to think about the old medium, the solidarity, the blogging. If, I mean, all we need to count if you would really want to make, you know, an alliance uh, in, that say, uh, in that way. Um, that's what I think, um, because it's as I as we think these days. I mean, as I, my thoughts in these days is all about the militarization and extent of militarization of social relations, particularly in civil society organizations, including international organization and the United Nations. So as long as that's can, if we cannot challenge that, we cannot challenge racialized racial and a structural inequality and capitalism, the way we frame it. Capitalism come, I mean, capitalism's intervention, we, we can see in terms of social transformation. So there will be no social transformation as long as we don't, if we don't uh, try to challenge this militarization process in, 
in everyday making of our life and institution, uh, in an in institutional context. I mean, it is interesting to see that gender, peace, and security is a department. Peace, security, gender, how can it three can be together? And if this can be together in a university or any universities, then it is a question that uh, what is omitted and what gets erased. Yes, uh, thank you. We have here another question from Anna Silvia. She's asking, Farin, very interesting. This is your proposition, situated solidarity. Seems to yeah. be based on a special logic, she's asking. Yes, I know. A special logic, uh, as, I, as we say, that it's not about the identity and the, our positionality. And uh, that is the reason I think I took a long time to discuss about Habib's identity and how he has been positioned and my identity and how we have positioned. It is all about our accounts, what we are, but what has made us together. Uh, and that is our concern. That, and that concern emanated from our political reflexivity and particularly from our vulnerabilities. So that, that, that and thus we ground the situated solidarity. It could be messy because it, it has to be messy because there is no way we can connect. There is no way middle-class educated uh, uh, women as a, as a senior lecturer in a um, posh university cannot relate with an activist, with a, with, a, with a person who left his country in 1999 as a 19 years old, and then, then had been in Thailand and Malaysia, being trafficked, worked in uh, uh, all those Thai boats, and then came to Australia and had been in prison in Christmas Island. No way we can, we can uh, our identity and positionality can be, you know, can, 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 can be brought us together. It is our accounts that we provide, which Butler, such, which Butler has argued that it's, it's not, it, it is something that, that that has brought together our relationality, our relational approach, the way we relate, that constitutes our situated solidarity. So it, it is, it is so transnational risk, um, feminist, they have talked about this Dolit, Dolit women or the Shidibu caste women who had been due to the religion, due to the relig, religion, Hindu religion, thousands of years cannot cannot express themselves, not, 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 not express, cannot be presented historically, socially, culturally. And then when these NGOs and other agencies came to empower them, they again become doubly disempowered. That was the method that has drawn uh, me to understand that how our, our messiness can be an issue that has brought us together to come out with this situated solidarity. How we situate our solidarity over the time over and, and the sp space, time, and, and our concerns, drawing on that. Okay, uh, we, we have nine minutes. Um, someone, I'd like to know if someone wants to open the mic. Okay, um, Irene, uh, would you like to uh, say someone, someone, yeah, something uh, else? I, now, I want to go back to Anna's uh, um, question again, that is partial logic. Yes, uh, you, you were quite right. It is our, our geography, I mean, fame, like uh, we draw from Sen here, Anna, that Sen and Mamdani's. Mamdani's research is on um, uh, genocide in Africa. And uh, Sen talked about feminine in uh, Southeast and East Asian context. And there they have told uh, that uh, it is interesting to see that both feminine and genocide has a geography. On the other hand, this geography is not something that we should consider the way the place-based research or 
into our um, or contextual research they consider and then they uh, labelize us as an expert like Farin is expert on South Asia it's not that geography it is the it is beyond this colonial geography the geography of the people the way people in people the way people live in the space not invade the space uh, so thank you um uh we want to thank you so much for being here today we learned a lot and, uh, thank it's you so a pleasure for inviting me to uh, it's a pleasure and it's a pleasure to to see the friends and uh, it's a pleasure to know you and all thank yes so um that be only the first time <laughs> and it's a pleasure uh, to be here with you I'd like to thank Mar Marina too, and thank everyone who watched, who asked questions. Uh, we wish you a good event and a good day to everyone. And so with this, thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye. Tchau, gente. Até mais. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.